Okay, so today we're going to be looking at Goblin Market, just the first part, because as you've probably realised from looking at your anthology, this is the world's longest poem, and possibly Rossetti's most famous poem. So, a little bit of context before you start. This was written in 1859, and at the time Rossetti was volunteering at a penitentiary for fallen women, so helping people out who had been promiscuous, had babies out of wedlock or had had affairs and been um, abandoned by their husbands or working women, sex workers, that kind of thing. So she was working amongst those kinds of women. So that's really important when you're thinking about this poem. So in terms of literary context, this has always been described as a poem that blends genres because it's part children's poem, it's part scary warning. So it's quite disorientating for the reader. And leading on from that, it's quite an experimental form. So there is a lot of irregular measure in it. And Ruskin said that. So it doesn't conform to meter or rhyme. So sometimes it will rhyme, sometimes it doesn't. But again, it, it kind of adds to this disorientation for the reader that sometimes you're expecting a rhyme to come and it doesn't happen. So it really does throw you off when you're reading it. Um, something that was quite interesting in terms of the context is that Rossetti's poem became fetishised in Playboy magazine in 1973. So they ran a special on it and came up with their own sort of story and their own sort of imagery surrounding Goblin Market. Obviously, you can Google it if you would like to. Um, but the idea is then that this poem is a poem of sexuality and depraved sexuality rather than anything else, because we'll look at some of the other meanings in a minute. But the overall sense is that this is a poem about sexuality. So it's possible allegorical readings. There are loads for this poem and you can apply all of them throughout. Some of them will work better at different points. Some of them will be less relevant. But it's really important that you have an understanding of all the different kinds of allegories that you could apply. So firstly, this could be a parable of female resistance and the dangers of giving in to temptation. So the idea of being a strong, independent woman compared with the fallen woman, which is the woman that she was working with at the penitentiary. It could be an allegory of addiction and recovery. So in the at the time that this was written, there was lots of opium use, especially amongst the people that Rossetti would have surrounded herself with, the writers and the poets and the artists. Remember, her brother was a very famous, po uh, famous artist and he would have quite often dabbled in the use of opium. The dangers of feminism is another reading of this. So remember, it's a bit uncertain as to whether Rossetti was a feminist or not. Sometimes she seemed like she was, sometimes she seemed like she wasn't. And this could be an allegory of how becoming a feminist actually leads to your downfall. It could be a allegory for living with and without religious faith. It could be about the fall of man and specifically Eve's fall. Or it could be a reference to the Victorian marriage market, hence the goblin market part. And that basically means that women were commodities to be sold to the highest bidder and men would often come and charm these women into getting married to them. And the result of the marriage was often an unhappy one. So we're just going to start our analysis section by section, because as I mentioned, this is a really long poem and this is only the first part that we're looking at today. So the first part, morning and evening, maids heard the goblins cry, come buy our orchard fruits, come buy, come buy. Okay, so the first thing to notice, obviously, is the repetition, or sorry, the statement of the times. So morning and evening. This suggests that whatever is tempting the women, whether it be religion or freedom from religion, or whether it's sexuality or whether it's drugs, whichever allegory you apply to it, the temptation is relentless because it happens in the morning and it happens in the evening. So it's interesting that the only people that can hear these cries are unmarried women. So the suggestion here from Rossetti is that these are the most vulnerable people perhaps in society because they are the ones who stand to risk the most. So remember, in terms of Victorian context, women 
relied on their reputation because their reputation got them a good husband or had the good standing in society. Without your reputation, you could be completely disowned. So you had the most to lose by giving in to temptation. So it's the goblins that are calling to the women and the use of goblins have always been associated with being grotesque and being evil. So Rossetti's point is that the things that are calling the women are messengers of evil, perhaps linking them quite closely with Satan. And then we've got the orchard fruits. So they're offering the women orchard fruits. And obviously, literally in the story, this is a story of goblins who come and offer the women lots of different fruits. But the fruits could be metaphorically representations of opium or they could be representations of sexuality. So you can read these either way. Fruits, you can also link to knowledge as well. So devouring knowledge like Eden in the Garden of Eden when Eve took the knowledge and then something bad happened to her, the fall of man. So you can apply different ideas to this fruit analogy. So the come by, come by, the repetition of that echoes the invitation from Isaiah in the Bible, where it states, come by without cost. So in the Bible, there wasn't a cost for you to come and share in the food and the fruits. But obviously, there is a cost in this poem to the girls who want to taste the fruits or buy the fruits. And it's the idea that their freedom is replaced with entrapment. So they're entrapped by sexuality or by drugs or whatever it is that is causing them to have a downfall. The next section of the poem reveals what the goblins have to sell. And it just turns out to be a really long list of different fruits. So when we're looking at the fruits, we want to think about the meaning of them and the contextual significance of them. So firstly, we've got apples. And as I mentioned previously, in the Garden of Eden, the apple was from the tree of knowledge. So the fact that these are for sale, it could be that these men are selling knowledge to the girls. And actually, this is an anti-feminist warning from Rossetti that if you have this knowledge, it will cause your downfall. So don't try and be feminist. Don't try and step out of your own um, defined role from God. Stay where you are. Otherwise, bad things will happen to you. Quinces, they are Sidonian pears and they're aromatic and pink. So the idea behind using the quinces is just because these are tempting fruits and they're quite feminine fruits as well, or stereotypically feminine fruits. And the fact that they're aromatic and pink makes them seem really nice and really appealing to the girls. The unpecked cherries are typically cherries we associate with um, virginity. And so when someone's cherry is plucked, it's a euphemism for losing your virginity. So that could be the reference here. And then we've got a list of melons, peaches, mulberries, cranberries. There are lots of tempting fruits and they're listed for effect because it makes it seem really exotic. So the use of the listing and the commas to show the massive list that there is shows that there's something for everybody. So nobody can really escape this selling of fruit because there's a fruit for everybody there. With the cranberries, you've got the idea of them being wild, freeborn. And perhaps this is a feminist dream. So perhaps there's um, an implication that eating those cranberries could free you in a way that women wanted to be freed from the boredom of their domestic lives. Interestingly, there's a contrast between different types of fruits. So you've got cranberries compared with blackberries and peaches. So you've got very bitter fruit compared with very sweet fruit, which could represent the highs and lows of drug abuse. So the highs are where you're off your nut on whatever drug you've decided to take and you're having a great time. And then the lows are when you come down and you come off it and it's very unpleasant. So that could be what this is representing. Or it could be representing the fantasy versus reality of marriage or sex. So the idea that you get this good promise of love and respect and pleasure. And then actually what you end up with is being alone and being used and abused. So there could be a reference to the highs and the lows of this, almost like a hidden warning. And the sibilance on the apricots, the strawberries, the blackberries, the apples, this sibilance emphasises a sensual sound. So there's this very sexualised undertone of this list of seemingly innocent fruit. 
and this has a very sing-song rhythm so this is what we spoke about at the beginning with the um up and down meter the alternating meter here it mimics the sound of street vendors but it also makes it sound very playful very nursery rhyme-ish so it's it's like a warning hidden in a nursery rhyme following on from the list of fruit the writer mentions that they are all ripe together and that could be talking about the fruit or it could be talking about the people as being in their sexual prime because it's the idea of everybody being ripe and ready to be eaten or tasted. Then there's this urgency developed in the poem where morns that pass by, fair eaves that fly, come by, come by. There's a, a desperate need to consume which could be a reference to capitalism and the need for people to just constantly consume things or it could be about accessing your sexuality before you pass your prime this idea of women being left on the shelf or being past their sexual maturity it could be a reference to the victorian marriage market where if you didn't get bought pretty quickly then you would just be left so there's an urgency here that impresses upon the women in order to make them want to submit to these goblins and down here where it talks about the bright fire like barbary so again just talking about more fruit but they're described as fire like and the simile used here is interesting because the use of fire suggests a hidden warning to constantly throughout this even though the fruit look really appetizing and really exotic and want to be eaten there's always a subtle hint of sinisterness underneath. And with the repetition, sorry, with the mention of the fact that these are sweet to the tongue and sound to the eye, this is a rep uh, reference to the temporal delights. Similar to what you looked at last time with the world, these temporal delights can be seen and they can be touched. It doesn't do anything for your soul or for your personality. It's just about things that you can have and you can consume. And there's a warning in that always with Rossetti that these are the things that you should resist because nothing good can come from them. Structurally here, we've got a repetition of time. So we've got the evening by evening now. So before it was morning and evening and now it's evening by evening. So it might be that the goblins have moved to the evening because the evening is a time where more dangerous things tend to happen people tend to associate the evening with sex and going out and doing things that perhaps you wouldn't do during the day similar to the way that day and night are presented in the world but it again just emphasizes this unrelenting temptation that it's every single day and perhaps this is a comment on the things that women have to put up with in the Victorian period, that in order to protect your own reputation, you have to keep resisting things and it's relentless. So these verbs here talking about the women, so these have just been introduced now, Laura and Lizzie, that they bowed their heads, they veiled their blushes, they clasped together and they cautioned their lips. All of these verbs suggest concealment. So this leads on to what I said just a minute ago about the fact that they're having to resist temptation, which means covering themselves up so that they aren't susceptible to it and they're not vulnerable to it. However, there's a contrast at the bottom. So even though they're veiled and they're bowed, they have tingling cheeks, which suggests that there is part of these women that want to engage in whatever it is that the goblins are trying to sell, whether it's drugs, whether it's sex, whether it's wisdom. They want to have part of it because they're starting to tingle, so they're starting to get excited by it. So it suggests some sort of awakening. And then Lizzie and Laura are the two characters that we're introduced to here. Lizzie is the pious, religious, um, perfect Victorian woman who resists all temptation. And Laura is the one who's more susceptible and she gives in to temptation. So look out for the juxtaposition between these two characters. However, there's also a queer theory perspective on this that actually Lizzie and Laura were in a relationship and the reason why Lizzie doesn't want Laura to go to the goblins is because she doesn't want to give her over to men. She wants to keep her for herself. And that could be linked to the idea that because Rossetti never married, there's always a question of sexuality, especially in the Victorian times. So that's something to again think about when you're looking at the way that these women are presented. 
This queer theory is supported here by the fact that Laura asks Lizzie to lie close. So the idea that perhaps she's trying to hold her close to hers because she doesn't want to lose her to anybody else. However, it could just be friendly or sisterly love that makes them want to protect each other from whatever's happening. So Laura has a golden head. And this is symbolic of the fact that women are commodities so can be bought and can be sold and they have a certain value. And obviously, Laura has quite a high value because she has a golden head. Hair was also a cultural commodity. So in the Victorian times, hair could be traded much like it can with the little princess charity. Obviously, that's not traded, but you can use it to produce wigs for people. That's what would have happened in the Victorian times, but you would have been paid for it. So if you had a lot of hair and you wanted to cut it and sell it, you could make quite a lot of money from it. So that's the representation here, just emphasising that women are commodities to be bought and sold. And then the fact that she pricks up her golden head, you could be thinking that this might be some sexual imagery. So again, this kind of leaking into what is innocent, certain sexual ideas, things that are not quite as innocent as we might have thought. Imperative verbs here from Laura. So she says, we must not look at the goblin men. We must not buy their fruits. So these suggest that there is danger that they shouldn't be doing this. However, it also seems quite rehearsed. So the idea of when you're little and you talk, don't accept sweets from strangers, that kind of idea. It loops around in your head as something to keep remembering. And that sounds like what Laura is doing here. She's rehearsing the fact that they can't go and see the goblin men, almost like she's convincing herself that that's what they shouldn't be doing. However, you could also say that this is Laura as a jealous lover, telling Lizzie that she can't go away. You must not go and look at the goblin men. You must stay with me. Could it also suggest that Laura is unsure of her convictions, that she needs to remind herself that she shouldn't go and look at the fruit? And then she warns that you do not know upon what soil they fed. So she's talking about the fact that they don't understand men. And that was very common of the Victorian period. So remember, unless you had brothers, your only real knowledge of men would be your father, who you probably wouldn't have seen that much because he would have been working, or if you were rich, you just wouldn't have seen your parents because you would have had a maid. But there's definitely a sense that women didn't understand men and suggests a naivety and an innocence to the two girls. And so remember, if something is unknown, it's always scary, it's always threatening. And this idea of feeding links quite nicely intertextually to Othello because Amelia describes men as stomachs and the idea that men just eat women and gorge on women and then when they're full they belch them and then they're done. So it's this again this warning that women are there to be used. And the fact that the goblins hobble suggests that they're disfigured. This could be a link to sexual disease. So remember the disfigurement that we witnessed in the world with leprosy, where they considered leprosy to be a punishment from God for sexual misdemeanors. So that could be why they hobble, because they're associated with dirtiness and illicit sexual relations. OK, so we get some dialogue from Lizzie now. So remember, Laura was trying to protect her. And now we've got Lizzie's take on things. Remember, Lizzie is the one who is the pious one. She's the one who's trying to stop Laura from doing things that she shouldn't do. So she changes the tone from must not to should not. So this suggests a degree of uncertainty. There's less conviction in should not compared with must not should not suggest that somebody is telling you you shouldn't do it, whereas must not makes it feel like it's more internalised. So is there then a change that they're being drawn towards the temptation? And then there's a repetition of concealment. So like in the previous part where they were bowed and veiled, in this part they're still covering themselves. So there's lots of um, need from them to have to cover themselves up so that they aren't vulnerable. However, Laura rears her glossy head. So we know that Laura's the one who is going to be susceptible to temptation. And the fact that she rears her head seems subversive because it seems like she's going against the grain and saying, actually, no, I want to explore this. She's curious. 
And this simile here suggests that there is the need to explore and there's a thirst for knowledge. She wants to know what's going on. She wants to explore further. And the restlessness that she puts across shows that she wants more than what she's got at the moment. So then Laura replies with, look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie. So this repetition shows an excitement that she's being tempted and she wants to know what's happening. She's trying to convince Lizzie that this is an exciting thing that she could come along and look at her, look at, look at with her. And then it's interesting that the goblins are now referred to by Laura as little men. So this seems less scary than goblins. And perhaps this is Laura trying to convince herself that they aren't as bad as they seem, or maybe that she is seeing them in a different light because she wants to explore them. But this is also the first time that their gender is revealed. So initially they seemed like they were genderless and now we know that they are men. So as we go down, we can see this repetition of one. So one holds a basket, one bears a plate, one lugs a golden dish. This repetition could suggest excitement. So a busyness that there are lots of different people coming. It could reflect a magnitude of suitors. So people coming to woo them, woo them and win their hand in marriage, that kind of thing. However, it could also be quite oppressive because it reflects the magnitude of temporal temptations so that they keep coming towards you and you can't escape it. So it's either exciting or it's scary. And there's always a very thin line between both of those things in Rossetti's poems. The way that the men are go goblins are presented, the verbs that are used are masculine verbs. So they lug things around, they haul things. It suggests a strength, which is something that stereotypically in the Victorian period, women would have looked for because they wanted strong children and strong men produce strong children. So it makes them quite alluring. And then they've got the gifts that they are giving. So they're going to give a basket, they're going to give a plate, they're going to give gold. So maybe suggestive that these men can fulfill these women's needs. So they can provide them with food, they can provide them with money. This echoes the idea of courtly love from the Renaissance period, the idea that men wooed women with gifts and love notes and that kind of thing. And there's exotic imagery down here about the idea of the grapes being luscious and the warm wind. This shows how Laura is yielding to temptation. It kind of tracks how she's changed from being afraid to thinking, actually, that does look quite nice. You can almost imagine her in a daze looking at them and thinking, yeah, no, I, I quite like the idea of that. It makes me think of Sleeping Beauty where she is in a trance and she's drawn towards the spinning wheel and nothing can distract her from it. That's how I imagine Laura at this point. And you could link this contextually to the Victorian fascination with the exotic. So the constant need to bring things in from different countries, to bring animals from different countries and to stuff them and to put them in a museum. They were constantly obsessed with having to own things from different places. And you could link this to post-colonial theory, the idea that things from the outer world were exotic but needed to be possessed by the colonial people. So bless Lizzie, she says, no, 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 no. She's trying to bring Laura back to her. She's really worried about what's gonna to happen to her friend or sister or lover, or whatever she is. This repetition here juxtaposes Laura's previous look, look, so it really shows the difference between the two characters. So when you're writing about this, you can talk about the juxtaposition, juxtaposition between Laura's look, look and Lizzie's no, no. So there's a difference between the two and how they conduct themselves. The rhyme between charm and harm links a warning. So the idea that charm and everything that goes with charming, sex, marriage, relationships, that kind of thing, links back to being harmed. So perhaps this is Rossetti's view on sex and marriage and relationships. And that's what she's warning her sister or her friend that she shouldn't do. And then she talks about their metaphorical evil gifts. This is quite hyperbolic in its imagery and it's quite rep reminiscent of the Old Testament where everything that was sensual was really bad and really evil. And the fact that then she thrust a dimpled finger into each ear, again, this is quite a phallic image, quite a masculine verb. It could reveal subversion. So the idea that perhaps she's being infected by 
the ideas of these goblins and she's trying desperately to stop herself but but it's kind of impinging on the way that she even moves and then again there's a rhyme link between ran and man and this again represents a difference between the two girls so one of them runs away and the other one stays and stares at the men so lizzie runs she puts her fingers in her ears and she runs away whereas laura just stays there and kind of just views these men so again you can see that there's a juxtaposition between the two women that is referenced in the language and this rhyme is what helps to link those two together and again with the alliteration with laura and linger this link between the two words because of the alliteration associates linger with laura so she is thought of as a character now who kind of hangs about and waits for bad stuff to happen to her this is another example of a comparative stanza. So throughout, you can see lots of comparisons between what was initially viewed and then what is subsequently viewed. So before we had men knocking about, carrying things and giving things to the women. And now what we have is a list of sinister looking half men, half animal people. So this represents the change in the pre presentation of the goblins. So initially they were bringing gifts and now they are actually perhaps showing what their true intentions are. And we've got some comparison in the verbs that are used as well. So before they were noble and they were strong and they were lugging and they were bearing and now they're tramping and crawling. So now they're sneaky and they're sinister. The similes here as well, like a snail, comparing to a rat, comparing to a wombat, utilises zoomorphism. So that's basically the application of animal characteristics to things that aren't animals, similar to personification, but with animal characteristics. This makes them all seem very unnatural, which again, it leads to the idea of them being disfigured in some way because of some evil force. And the choice of animals is really important as well. So you could pick up on the fact that a rat has been used. Obviously, rats are vermin. They spread disease, maybe a link to sexual disease there. And they're quite ferocious and aggressive as well. So they look quite small and they look quite unassuming. And then they turn around and bite you. So it's that idea that there's a lot of danger in these animals. Down here where it says she heard a voice like, sorry, she heard a voice like voice of doves. This is omniscient narration, but it's from Laura's perspective. So we've changed the narration now so that it's more focused on Laura. And the way that she hears them is completely different to the way that they've been described. So previously, they're cats, they're rats, they're snails, they're all ugly. But she hears a voice of doves. And this perhaps suggests that Laura has been completely deceived. She's been tricked into believing they're something that they're not. And perhaps this is Rossetti saying that you can be tricked by the devil because the devil has many faces. It's that, side, it's that idea. Or you can be tricked into marrying somebody on false promises. And actually what happens is they turn out to be something really scary and sinister. But there is this sense that despite the danger that's presented, the girls are still very much intrigued. So the dichotomy here reveals the deception, similar to the world, where the world during the daytime deceived the narrator into believing that nothing bad was going to happen and you could still maintain your faith. This is what's happening here. And this idea of deception is really important to Rossetti, kind of feeling out for all of the temptations and resisting them at any cost. Which again is complemented by the idea of they sounded kind and full of love. So this sound, this verb here is really important because that suggests deception. And then we're still on Laura. She stretches her gleaming neck. So the idea of stretching makes you think maybe of a meerkat stretching up and trying to see something. So this just complements the fact that she is very curious about what's going on. And then you've got her neck being exposed by the fact that she stretches and for some reason or other, the neck has always been associated with sexuality. And when you think of the Gothic and you think of vampires and Dracula, the neck was always the place where women were bitten and um, blood was drawn from them because this was the site of sexuality. So the fact that she exposes her neck suggests a vulnerability. The swan 
is a symbol of purity and elegance and it was also sacred to Venus who was the goddess of love so again we've got these links to sexuality which are being trickled in through this natural imagery and the natural imagery makes everything seem lovely and innocent but actually you can see that they're threaded through it are these warnings and then the lily is the dichotomy between purity and death so is this a warning from Rossetti is she saying that you can tread a very thin line between pleasure and pain and purity and sacrilege what's the line where do you cross that is one just a way into the other and a poplar tree is often associated with fertility so again you can see that even though they're natural images they have been chosen specifically by Rossetti because they have links to sexuality in some way and then the vessel with the simile used here is the vessel a representation of escape for Laura does she want to go somewhere else does she want to be somebody different is this a feminist idea or is it saying that she's a vacuous person so she's not thinking very much she's just empty-headed or is it a yonic image so does that refer to a vagina is that something that's just waiting to be filled up by these men and then the final line where it says where its last restraint has gone suggests that there has been a yielding to temptation. So the restraint has gone, perhaps because Lizzie has left and Laura's by herself and she needs Lizzie around to be able to restrain herself and resist temptation. So the suggestion now is that she has had some sort of release and she's just giving in to temptation. Which brings us on to the idea of the contextual fallen woman. Is Laura now the fallen woman?